All right, you are invited to get out your Bible or go to the Morning Star app to find today's reading from the New Testament, Luke chapter 1. If you're using the app, you tap on Worship, and then you tap on Read the Bible. The reading will appear on your screen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be, to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who has said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So our internet is down. Not anymore. Are we back up? I was going to say this is like the second time in a month. Okay, so our friends online, welcome back. We are so glad that you are with us. People in the tech room, I've already switched to analog, so I'm going to need you to help me with the slides. Good? Okay, very good. Hi, everyone. In case you haven't met me yet, I'm Amy wilson Feltz. I am the pastor here at Morningstar. Grace and peace to you. As we prepare to move into our message today, I do have a youth word. So for those of you who are new, our youth give me a word every week. And if I can work it into the sermon, then I get to keep my dollar. And if I can't, then they get a dollar. I thank you very much. So we'll see if I can do that, Hayden. Please keep your Bibles open to Luke chapter 1, but also bookmark Philippians chapter 4. Luke chapter 1, and then... Philippians chapter 4. Let's take a deep breath. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight this morning, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Everybody say thanks to Brishan <laughs> and Amarillo and Zaid and everyone who keeps us going. 20 years ago, I suffered a terrible heartbreak. It was a breakup with someone whom I loved deeply and I had imagined a future. Now, in the day-to-day, -day, I remained functional, but emotionally and internally, I was devastated. And I developed this kind of inner narrative that told me that I was not good enough. Right? That I carried around this, this pain of rejection, and I wondered if I would ever find peace again. Peace is one of those states of being that we can try to create for ourselves, but is much more likely to be revealed. And the idea of revelation is central to our current Advent worship series, which we're calling Revealed experiencing the extraordinary through the ordinary. Advent is the season before Christmas. Remember, it's that season of active waiting that invites us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus once again and for what it really means for God to be with us. 
So in this season of Advent, we're thinking about what it means for the birth of Jesus to make known, to reveal God's presence with us today. The idea of revelation invites us to consider ways that we can experience things like hope, which is what we talked about last week, and this idea that hope is revealed in our relationships as we anchor ourselves in God's faithfulness, and also peace. That's where we're turning today, this idea of peace. It's a word we say in the church world quite often, right? Peace be with you. Let there be peace on earth. May they rest in peace. The word peace can generally mean the absence of conflict, right? like an end to war. And that seems really nice. It's a great thought. But in terms of our faith, peace is much more than a lack of disturbance. The words that we translate as peace in our holy text actually refer to wholeness and harmony that we experience through living in right relationship with God, with other human beings, and with creation. Peace is about right relationship with God and other human beings and all of creation, regardless of our circumstances at the time. That means that peace doesn't just follow the storm. It can be revealed or uncovered in the midst of the storm, within the disturbance. So we're going to look at Mother Mary's story as an example of this truth. So I invite you to turn again to Luke chapter 1. We'll reread verses 28 through 34. And our passage today speaks of Mary's visit from an angel. And at this time, Mary is probably around 14 to 19 years old. Right? We don't think about that sometimes. Betrothed to a man named Joseph, and Mary is a good girl in her community, beyond reproach in her community. And the angel comes and enters the picture and turns everything upside down. So let's read verses 28 through 34 again. I like to read out of my Bible. I hope you have yours as well. If not, you can listen along, and that is fine too. Luke 1, 28. And the angel came to Mary and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But Mary was much perplexed by these words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God, and now you will, re you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great. He will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? Greetings. Favored one, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. And we tend to think of favor as approval or support that we earn through merit or through relationship. And when we do a favor for someone, that earns us even more in a relationship, right? Even more approval. In the original language, the word that is translated as favor here is the same word for grace unmerited grace. So the angel is telling Mary that she has been chosen to bear the Messiah, and it's not based on anything that she's done or not done. It's, it's truly an act of God's grace. And Mary is listening to this story and the, the words of the angel and, and hearing the prophecy, this idea that the Messiah would come to save her people, and she knows this is going to land her in a mess of trouble. So let's think about what Mary was risking in that moment. As a woman 
Mary was not considered to be fully human in her society. She did not have the same rights as a man. She could not live outside of the household of her father or her husband. She was essentially property of the men who provided for her. And the penalty for adultery and certainly for bearing a child that did not belong to your betrothed was death by stoning. So even if Joseph would choose to dissolve the relationship quietly to spare Mary's life, where would a divorced single mother in that day and age go? So just to be clear, as a result of God's favor, Mary is risking her good name, the security that her family provides, and the very blood in her veins. So good for her for asking the question, how can this be? How can this be? Like with Zechariah last week, in this question, the impossible becomes possible. And also, like with Zechariah, Mary is giving a sign. She's given a sign of God's faithfulness, the same sign that Zechariah received. The pregnancy of Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, Mary's relative, And then the angel reinforces God's trustworthiness with that famous line in verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. Grayson's favorite verse, if I remember correctly. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now we see these or similar words at least seven times in our holy text in both the Old and the New Testaments, along with numerous stories to back up this claim, right? All emphasizing that God is able to do beyond what is in the reach of human beings. God is able to do beyond what is in our reach. And the Apostle Paul embraces this theme in this famous passage from Philippians chapter 4, which is why I asked you to bookmark it. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. So let's read that together as well. Now let's keep in mind that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi to celebrate the people's good work and to encourage them to remain faithful in difficult times. And so we find in Philippians 4, verse 6 and verse 7, Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding— will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So often we emphasize verse 6 and this idea of anxiety and how to deal with it and how to pray. But I want to highlight this morning verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. This morning, I would submit to you that it's that peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding, and not a persuasive argument from a, an impressive angel that brought Mary to this place where she could say, here I am, let it be. Let it be. It's an extraordinary response from an ordinary person whose heart must have been racing as her mind flooded with everything that was coming toward her to disturb not just her current life, but her life plan. Let it be. It is not a statement of resignation. It's a statement of faith that includes a willingness to do what God is asking to go where God is sending, to stay on the path knowing that God will reveal the next step, even if it's just step by step. It's when we're able to align our own personal agency with the will of God, with our trust in God's will, that the peace that surpasses all understanding becomes revealed. When we're able to align our own agency with our trust in God, The peace that passes understanding is available to us. And no, it doesn't make sense. It's peace that surpasses understanding, right? 
And thank God for that because our understanding, it fails us on the regular. And then we weave these false narratives to try to make sense of things that just don't. After my big breakup, my brain got stuck in this loop that told me I wasn't good enough. And Hayden, I just felt like crying in my macaroni. <laughs> I was holding on to that one. I was just hoping I didn't forget. Honestly, it wasn't until my next boyfriend, several, several months later, said something utterly ridiculous about me to my face that I snapped out of it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I have to make peace with myself and whatever God has in store for me next. It's a shallow example, of course, my heartbreak compared to what Mary faced. But the truth is, any one of us could name any number of disturbances right now in the world and in our lives that keep us stuck in these false narratives. So I've created these cards for us. Look like this. To invite us to think about... What is disrupting our souls? Maybe it's a situation, maybe it's a person. So we're going to take a moment to think about that. And, and you can write it down if you like, or you can just think about it. Who or what is causing disruption right now in your soul? And now take the other side of the pen that is in front of you and scratch off the silver sticker to reveal our, our posture, our invitation for the week. What does it say? What does it say? Peace, right, it says peace, no surprise. Right? But the work of uncovering peace is not easy. Uncovering peace requires us to be willing to imagine a different future. And so that's our, our next action, our call to action, because Advent is a season of active waiting. Who needs a gesture of peace from you? And could you reach out? You don't have to write it down right now if you don't want to. You can think about it. But at some point, write down a name, even if it's your own. Even if you need a gesture of peace from yourself. Either way, let's listen for the invitation from God to respond with, here I am. Let it be. Because the truth is, peace is revealed through ordinary people like us. Amen? Amen. We are moving now into a time of prayer. And kids, in your worship bags, we have these wooden crosses that you can hold as a connection to God and to each other as we pray. Gracious and loving God, in the middle of our busy, messy lives, you show up, not with loud demands, but with a quiet invitation to peace. And like Mary, we don't always understand how it will work out, but you remind us that we don't have to because you're with us. When the world feels overwhelming, enable us to breathe deeply, to breathe deeply your peace, a peace that steadies us and calms us and anchors us in hope. And as we move through this Advent season, help us carry that peace into the world, to bear it in the world in our words, in our actions, and even in silence. Let your peace flow through us so others might feel it too. We trust you, God. Let it be.